Hello, everyone, and welcome to our question lab. We're happy to have you here today as we discuss immunology. Leading our discussion today, once again, is Dr. Paris Fakari, and he's going to introduce himself now. Paris. Thank you, Sean. Hey, guys, my name is Paris. I'm a current dermatology resident here in Dallas, Texas. I originally graduated from pharmacy school and then uh, went back home to Michigan to complete medical school. Um, and I'm also an RX coach with USMLE RX. So uh, what that means is I work one on one with students such as yourselves to uh, help prepare you guys for the step one and step two CK as well. Excellent. We're happy to have you here. As always, we also have some wonderful panelists joining us, Jeff and Kate, who you'll meet later on. My name is Sean. I've been with RX Coach for over two years now, working with our coaches and students to help them accomplish their goals. And we'll talk more about RX Coach a little bit later this evening. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and tackle our first of four questions on the topic of immunology. The methodology we use today will be the same methodology that we use in RX Coach. And if you look, you will notice that the answer choices are missing. That is by design we do that because we don't want the answer choices to guide or dictate your thought process. And we don't want you to see an answer choice that you are unfamiliar with that may cause you to panic as you're trying to answer the question. Once we cover up the answer choices, we will read the lead in. The lead in is the last sentence of the question itself. And the reason we do that first is because as you read the vignette, we want you to know what you're looking for, what the test writer is asking, so that you can pick up on all of those relevant clues and not have to reread the question and waste valuable time. So let's go ahead and read that lead in now. Which of the following is most directly responsible for this patient's current presentation? Which of the following is most directly responsible for this patient's current presentation? Once we read the lead in, we'd like to ask our students how many steps they believe this question will require. And we do that because we want you to have an organized thought process so you don't make any careless mistakes on test day and maximize every point possible. An example of a one-step question could be where you ask for the diagnosis. An example of a two-step question could be where you ask for the treatment of a diagnosis. And an example of a three-step question could be where you're asked for the mechanism of, action, uh, mechanism of action for a treatment for a diagnosis. So I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll go ahead and read that lead in. I see the responses coming in, so let's go ahead and take a look at that lead in. A 57 year old Hispanic man presents to the office with a severe cutaneous rash over his back that has developed over several weeks and intractable watery diarrhea. One month earlier, he was diagnosed with adult T cell leukemia and received a bone marrow transplant from an unrelated donor. He is taking an immunosuppressive regimen that includes cyclosporin, mycophenolate, and prednisone. And they give us the lab values and they are alanine aminotransferase of 1032, Aspartate aminotransferase of 829, creatinine of 1, lactate dehydrogenase of 634, and alkaline phosphatase of 446. And then we have the lead in again, which is which of the following is most directly responsible for this patient's current presentation? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So we are going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead in. So starting off with the vignette, you know, generally the first thing they're going to give you are demographics. And in this case, it's a 57 year old Hispanic male. OK, so it's always important to make note of that because that will really start to clue you in a lot of times as to what's going on with the patient. OK. Then it's important to take note of why are they coming to the doctor? Why are they going to the hospital? Why are they at the ER? In this patient, it's because of a severe rash and watery diarrhea, okay? A lot of times they'll then also tell you how long it's been going on. In this case, they did that as well, several weeks. So it's important to make note of that. Um, is this acute? Is this chronic? 
um, and that will really help clue you in as well, okay? Um, then after that, a lot of times they'll give you past medical history, and in this case, there is a lot of relevant medical history, especially from a hematologic standpoint, okay? Um, and then also, past uh, uh, what other medications is he taking? And in this case, they are giving us three immunosuppressive medications that he is taking. So all important to make note of. And then they actually give us some laboratory values. You can, as you can tell there, some of those are very abnormal, okay? So hopefully you guys were able to pick up on that. Um, and it's important to, to highlight those and make note of it because it may come in handy when you're answering that question, okay? So then when we get to the lead-in, they're asking us what's most directly responsible for the current presentation, okay? So I think we have um, at least two steps going on here. I think we have one, uh, what is the current presentation? What is the, the diagnosis? What's the name of this presentation? Um, and then two, what is the pathogenesis or the pathophysiology of that condition? So I think we have a nice two-step question here, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices. And as you can see here, there are four answer choices, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna start at the bottom with answer choice D, and we're gonna work our way up to the top, okay? And we recommend students do this as well. You know, a lot of times we'll see students who they'll start at the top, they'll work their way down, they'll see something they like, and then they'll select it without having gone through all the answer choices. So um, to help you prevent that and from bias, prevent yourself from biasing yourself, so we, we recommend doing uh, starting from the bottom and working your way up to the top. So we'll go ahead and do that now as well. Answer choice D, recipient cytotoxic T cells. C, recipient antigen presenting cells presenting donor peptides. B, immunoglobulins and fibrinoid necrosis. And A, alloreactive donor T cells. And I believe on the next slide, there is a higher, uh, the uh, bigger picture of that uh, picture you can see there, just so you can take a nice look at that, okay? Make sure you guys are gathering your thoughts, and then we'll go ahead and open up that poll. You guys can select what you think is the most correct answer here, the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Paro. So as you can see, the poll is open. We'll wait once again until about two-thirds of you have responded. Remember that there is no penalty for guessing on test day, which is why you should never leave a question blank. Even if you're unsure on testing, make sure you pick an answer. In the event, you might guess correctly. There's certainly no penalty for guessing tonight, so if you're unsure, don't worry. Pick your best answer choice, and we'll review the incorrect and correct answers here in just a few moments. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more seconds here. All right. Well, let's take a look and see what you have selected today for our first question. And it looks like it was close, but in first place with 37% was alloreactive donor T cells. In second place, we had recipient cytotoxic T cells. And in a close third place, we had recipient antigen presenting cells presenting donor peptides. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is A, allore uh, alloreactive donor T cells. And 37% of you got it right. So once again, a challenging question. Let me hand it off to Barra so you can explain it to us. Barra. Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely a tough question. Definitely one of those tough immuno questions. So what's going on here? Well, you know, obviously this patient came in because of two main things, right? Watery diarrhea and a severe rash, okay? And you could tell it's a very erythematous. It's a very red rash, right? On top of that, we know that there are some abnormal liver function tests. The ALT is very high. The AST is very high. The ALK phosphatase is very high. So this should raise suspicion for something called graft versus host disease, okay? And it's an adverse effect, specifically uh, something you see commonly with bone marrow transplants, um, but it's an adverse effect of transplants 
in general, but specifically also bone marrow transplant. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Sean has gone ahead and pulled up a table on transplant rejection and first aid, okay? Very high yield table. You can see there at the very bottom, we're dealing with graft versus host disease, okay? So the grafted T cells, AKA the donor T cells, proliferate in the host and reject the host cells, okay? So once again, the donor T cells reject the host cells, okay? You can see there, presentations, a maculopapular rash, um, jaundice, diarrhea, okay? Or at least the jaundice is uh, getting at liver function being abnormal, okay? And, and like it says, usually bone marrow patients, okay? Now, if we take a look at the other types of rejections, there's hyperacute, there's acute, there's chronic, you can see there that they have different pathogenesis. So with the hyperacute, we're talking about pre-existing antibodies in the recipient that react to antigens in the donor, from the donor, okay? With acute transplant rejection, we're talking about uh, T cells that are activated against donor MHC, or major histocompatibility complexes, okay? And then with chronic rejection, we're talking about uh, T cells that respond to antigen presenting cells in the recipient that are presenting donor peptides. Hopefully you guys, that phrase sounds familiar because that was actually one of the other answer choices, okay? So let's go back and take a look at the other answer choices as to why those are incorrect, okay? So recipient cytotoxic T cells, this would be acute type of graft rejection, okay? Answer choice C, what we just went over, recipient APCs that are presenting donor peptides, that's something you would see in chronic organ rejection. And then lastly, immunoglobulins and fibrinoid necrosis, that is something that is a hyperacute graft rejection that you would see immediately after transplant. And again, those other three answer choices are more common in solid organ transplant, so a kidney transplant, a liver, lung transplant. Um, whenever you start talking about bone marrow transplant, uh, you definitely want to start thinking about uh, chronic or uh, graft versus host disease as well. So a couple of clues there that this is graft versus host disease. Definitely a tough question, but hopefully you guys were able to pick up on some clues and can always go back and, and refresh over that table as well. So nice job on this question. Excellent. Yes, that was a tough question, but a good refresher. And a great explanation as always from Paris. So let's go ahead and move on now to our second question of the evening on immunology. As you can see, the answer choices are covered up once again. That is by design. So now let's go ahead and read that lead in. A defect or absence of which of the following is most likely responsible for this child's presentation? A defect or absence of which of the following is most likely responsible for this child's presentation? Once again, I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you think this question will require, and then we'll go ahead and read that lead in. All right, I see the responses coming in, so let's go ahead and read that vignette a two-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department with vomiting and diarrhea past medical history is significant for six prior hospitalizations involving pneumonia sepsis diarrhea and respiratory synthial virus infection the physical examination reveals no palpable lymph nodes lab testing shows absent t-cells normal B cells, and absent natural killer cells. IgA, IgE, IgG, and IgM levels are low. A defect or absence of which of the following is most likely responsible for this child's presentation? I'll give all of you a few moments here again to look at the important clues in the vignette and lead in as I hand it off to Paris. 
Thank you, Sean. So once again, we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. Okay. And starting off, we are now being told this is a two-year-old boy, so a pediatric case. Okay. And then why are they coming to the ER? Well, they've got vomiting and diarrhea. Okay. So important to make note of that. Again, they give us some past medical history. It looks like he's been hospitalized a bunch already. They tell you why as well. Okay. There's some physical exam findings. There are some very helpful lab tests as well. Okay. All important in this question because, as you can tell, this is definitely gearing us towards an immunology type question. Okay. And it's going to be important whenever they talk about lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, immunoglobulin levels, lymph nodes lymphoid tissue always important to make note of that just like we did here okay so then they're asking us uh, a defect or absence of what is most likely responsible okay so i think we've got a couple things to do here i think one we've got to figure out what is this patient's condition what is going on here okay this patient's been hospitalized a lot for infections at the age of two with some abnormal lab tests We've got to figure that out, figure out what's going on. Is there a unifying diagnosis here? Two, based off that, is there a specific defect or absence that is involved in the pathogenesis or pathophysiology of that condition? Okay. So I think, like the last question, I think we have another nice two-step question here. So let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices. We've got five answer choices this time. So once again, I'm gonna start at the bottom and I'm gonna work my way up to the top, okay? Answer choice E, RAG1, RAG1, D, interleukin-2 receptor subunit gamma, C, CD40 ligand, B, bruton tyrosine kinase, and A, adenosine deaminase. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Barra. So the poll is open. Once again, we'll wait until about two-thirds of you have responded. A reminder for all of you that we do have a raffle and a special offer at the end of tonight's session, so make sure you stick around. You might be our lucky winner. And if you're wondering what next week's topic is, next week's topic is pharmacology. So we hope you can tune in and join us next Tuesday for our question lab on farm. I see the responses coming in. We'll go ahead and wait a few more moments here. Remember that there is no penalty for guessing, so make sure you submit a response. You're gonna learn more if you play an active role all right, let's take a look and see what you selected. And it looks like in first place, we have interleukin-2 subunit gamma. And that's 35% of you selected D and 25% of you selected adenosine deaminase. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is D. So great job to those of you who got it right. 35% of you got it right. Another challenging question. But let's make sure you got it right for the right reasons. And if you didn't, don't worry because Boris is going to explain it to you now. Boris. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, it's definitely a tough question. Nice job, guys. So we've got a couple things going on here. So what is this patient's condition? Well, I think as a lot of you guys put together, this patient likely has SCID, or severe combined immunodeficiency, okay? This patient has low all of the above immunoglobulins, low IgA, E, G, and M. So hypogammaglobulinemia, recurrent infections, opportunistic infections, okay? And then also, we know there are absent T cells and absent natural killer cells, okay? There's also a lack of lymphoid tissue on exam. Remember, they told us the physical exam showed no palpable lymph nodes, okay? So not, that's, that's different than lymphadenopathy where you have enlarged lymph nodes, this is saying there's not even, uh, you're not even able to feel any lymphoid tissue at all, okay? So in SCID, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Sean has gone ahead and pulled up a table on this specific immunodeficiency. 
you can see there are various types of defects that can cause skid. Okay. The most common is the IL-2 receptor gamma chain. Okay, so that's always, if you're not sure which type of defect is going on, uh, IL-2 receptor gamma chain is the most common, okay? Um, it is also X-linked recessive. So keep in mind, our patient was a boy, okay? So presentation, chronic infections, diarrhea, failure to thrive. You can see there that uh, they also have... Uh, um, uh, various types of infections, very similar to what our patient added as well. Okay, so if we go back to the last slide, there's this helpful table actually in USMLE RX, the question bank, that shows the various types of skid and how they can be differentiated based on the the lack or presence of uh, uh, immune t uh, lymphoid tissue or lymph tissue, immune tissue. So you can see there, our patient had absent T cells normal B cells and absent natural killer cells. So that would be row two. You can see there that the most common defect for that is interleukin-2 receptor subunit gamma, which is answer choice D. If this patient had absent T cells and B cells, but did uh, have NK cells, then you could talk about Bragg mutations. If this patient had absent everything like the last row, then you could talk about adenosine deaminase deficiency, which was answer choice A, okay? Lastly, the other two answer choices, answer choice C, that is where you have hyper IgM, okay? Um, that mutation, that defect is caused by a mutation in CD40 ligand on T cells. However, IgM levels would be high. In this patient, they were low. Lastly, answer choice B, bruton tyrosine kinase. This is something that you can see um, in um, uh, Bruton's agammaglobulinemia or X-linked agammaglobulinemia, okay? Um, and you have a failure of B cell development with that. In this case, um, we know that the B cells are normal, so that's unlikely to be a correct answer choice here. So step number one was figuring out that this was skid, and step number two was figuring out which defect was most likely responsible. So definitely a tough question here. Uh, but great job to, to all of you guys out there. Excellent. So we're two questions in here. We've had some challenging ones, but hopefully everyone's learning. If you like the explanations in our approach, you should really consider Rx Coach. So Rx Coach is our coaching and tutoring service, and we work with students to help prepare them for med school exams, block exams, uh, subject-based shelf exams, comp exams, as well as USMLE step one and step two, along with COMLEX levels one and two. So if you're studying for one of the board exams or for a comprehensive shelf, the first thing we'll do is we'll administer one of our 160 question assessments. Based on that, we'll come up with a personalized study plan. If you're studying for a certain subject or a subject-based shelf or a block exam, we'll look at your syllabus and base the study plan off of that syllabus. We'll use our one-on-one -on -one approach and we'll work with you to identify your knowledge gaps and bridge them so that you can make studying more efficient. You know, a lot of times students in medical school, they say, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm studying. My friend said to do this, so I read this on Reddit, but it's really not translating into results. And that's simply because what worked for your friend or what worked for somebody that posted something online may not necessarily work for you simply because everybody is different. Everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. Everybody learns a different way and everybody applies what they know differently as well. So we'll work with you to create that personalized study plan, identify your knowledge gaps, bridge those knowledge gaps, strengthen that foundation you have when it comes to content, but also work with you individually to work on your test taking skills. As you know, we've authored a, a great deal of resources. Uh, RX360, for example, uh, it includes BRICS, which you'll hear more about later. It includes our question bank, QMAX. It includes our express videos, as well as our flash facts, and you'll get access to all of those. We're one of the only companies out there who are actually in medical education teaching medical students for decades before we started our tutoring program. So we use the data and the experience we've learned throughout those years to make a program that's really progress-based and data-driven, which is probably why we've had so much success with it. So if you're interested in learning more and really maximizing your potential on, on test day, reach out to us at rx-coach or rx-coach.com. Click on that free consultation tab so we can talk about the program and how it can benefit you. All right.
With that being said, let's go ahead and get into our third question of the evening. I do want to remind you that we do have a raffle and a special offer at the end. So make sure you stick around because you must be present to win. Next week's topic, once again, is going to be pharmacology. Let's go ahead and get into our third question of the evening. We'll begin with the lead in. So here we go. Dysfunction in which of the following immune cells is most likely to cause the problem encountered by this patient? Dysfunction in which of the following immune cells is most likely to cause the problem encountered by this patient? Once again, I'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you think this question will require. And then we'll read the vignette. All right, I see the responses coming in. Let's read that vignette. A 29 year old woman comes to her physician for recurrent painful lesions on her skin and tongue, which are causing difficulty eating. She has had these lesions frequently for many years and they never fully resolve. She also gets frequent vaginal yeast infections. She is otherwise healthy. On physical examination, there is ulceration, redness, and soreness of the corners of the mouth and the tongue and buccal mucous membranes are covered by white plaques. HIV test is negative. KOH smear of the mucosal lesion is shown. Dysfunction in which of the following immune cells is most likely to cause the problem encountered by this patient? I'll give all of you a few moments here to take a look at the important clues in the vignette and lead in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we are going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this uh, uh, vignette and the lead in. So now we have a 29 year old woman. Why is she coming to the doctor? Well, recurrent painful lesions, okay, on her skin, on her tongue. She's having a hard time eating. Okay. Um, they give us more information about these lesions. Okay. Always important to ask those uh, history of present illness questions, HPI questions. She has some past medical history that's important. And then they give us some important physical exam and lab test findings. Okay. Always important, um, especially in this, as you can tell, this is getting another immunology question. Okay. And then they give us a KOH smear as shown in that image. Okay. So then they're asking us a dysfunction in which immune cell most likely to cause the problem, okay? So I think we've got a couple steps to this question once again. I think one, we've got to figure out what is that problem? What is the diagnosis? Two, what, which immune cells or what is it, essentially what is the pathogenesis of that problem? Which dysfunction, what dysfunction is happening? that causes that problem. So I think we have another two-step question here. So let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices once again. And once again, we're gonna start at the very bottom and we're gonna work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, T helper type one cells. D, T helper 17 cells. C, neutrophils. B, natural killer cells and A, CD8 positive T cells. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll and then we'll let you go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer. Talk about it in just a few seconds. All right, everyone, well, here are the answer choices. The poll is open. We'll give you a few moments to respond. And then as always, we will review the incorrect and correct answer choices. And if you notice throughout the evening, we've been doing that. We want to make sure that you're getting it right for the right reasons, but also understanding from the incorrect answer choices or the distractors. So when you're doing questions on your own, make sure you're really studying all of those. And if you look at QMAX now, you're going to see really nice, detailed step-by-step -step explanations. So if it's a three-step question, you'll see step one, step two, step three, just like we're doing today. So make sure you're paying attention to all the distractors as well and really doing a comprehensive review of each question to maximize your benefit from each question that you do. See the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more seconds. 
All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. Looks like there's another clear favorite here. 32% of you selected CD8 positive T cells. And second and third place were almost tied with T helper 17 and T helper type one. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is D, T helper 17 cells. And 23% of you got it right. So definitely a challenging question. Let me hand it off to Paris so he can help us all master it. Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely a tough question. So what is going on in this patient? Well, we know a few things. We know that there are frequent vaginal yeast infections. Okay, so we know that there are yeast infections. And then we also know that the tongue and buccal membranes are covered by white plaques, okay? Something that we would call thrush, or oral candidiasis, okay? The patient also has redness near the corners of the mouth. We would call that chelitis, okay? All of these are conditions that can be caused by candida, okay? So this patient likely has chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Okay. And you can see there on, these, on the smear, you see these branching blue lines, okay? And these are pseudohyphae of candida, okay? So indicating that there's definitely a positive KOH test indicating some sort of uh, fungal, yeast, or dermatophyte infection, okay? Now, what is CMC? Well, on the next slide, Sean has actually gone ahead and pulled up that table from first aid, that very high yield, important immunodeficiency table, this time looking at CMC, okay? So specifically, impaired cell-mediated immunity against candida species, okay? So a lot of candida infections of the skin and mucous membranes, okay? Um, now, in terms of what is the, uh, the type of cell that is involved in this, um, with candidal infections and CMC, uh, one of the types of immuno, uh, immune cells involved in um, cytokines is T helper 17 cells. These are sort of considered regulatory T cells and they help produce interleukin 17, okay? So kind of easy to remember, TH17 makes IL-17 and this is crucial in the control of candida albicans, okay? So let's go back to the other answer choices, the vignette. We'll take a look at what the other answer choices might be getting at. So TH1 cells, those play a role against, uh, in defense against intracellular pathogens, okay? So maybe something like mycobacterium tuberculosis, okay? Not so much candida. Neutrophils, um, definitely wanna think about extracellular bacteria, okay? Not what's going on here. Natural killer cells, uh, that has to do with tumor cell surveillance and fighting off viral infections. Um, also not what's going on here. Um, and then lastly, CD8 positive T cells. Those are uh, responsible or mediate the killing of also cancer or viral infected cells. So also not a good answer here. So um, a nice high yield point here is that TH17 and IL-17 are very crucial to combating candida infections. Well, excellent, great job, everyone. That was our most challenging question this evening thus far based on the percentage correct, but hopefully Boris's explanation helped you out. Let's move on now to our fourth and last question on the topic of immunology this evening, and let's try to finish strong. Once again, the answer choices are covered up and we will begin with a lead in. Which of the following characteristics is most likely in this peripheral T cell? Which of the following characteristics is most likely in this peripheral T cell. I'll give all of you a few moments here to let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require, and then we'll read the vignette. All right, I see the response is coming in. Let's go ahead and take a look at that vignette. A peripheral T helper cell binds to a peptide bound MHC class two molecule on the surface of an antigen presenting cell. No additional binding occurs between cell surface molecules present on the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. 
which of the following characteristics is most likely in this peripheral T cell? Boris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we're gonna go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead in, okay? Now we've done this a few times today, so hopefully you guys are starting to get, the, get a sense of you know maybe what's important to highlight, what will help you when you go back and take a look at that question, okay? Maybe what's okay not to highlight. Um, and then also in that lead in, what are the specific things you should be looking for that will make sure that you answer that question that they are trying to ask you, okay? So we'll go ahead and do that here. And you can see here, there are a lot of important things in this question, in this vignette. It's a very short vignette. So obviously um, it's gonna be very concise, but important information. So um, you can see there, uh, those two statements, both important, and Sean has already read them out a couple of times, but um, you know, obviously important to what's going on in this immunology question. So then it's asking us about the characteristic most likely in this peripheral T cell, okay? So I think we've got a couple things going on. I think one, we need to figure out exactly maybe what's going on in this scenario that they're presenting to us, and then what is a characteristic we could see uh, in the T cell in this situation, okay? I think maybe another two-step question here, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at those answer choices, see what we're working with. You can see here we have five answer choices again as well. And once again, I'm going to start at the bottom. And I'm going to work my way up to the top. Answer choice E, it will undergo clonal expansion. D, it will cause the antigen presenting cell to undergo apoptosis. C, it will be activated but be unable to perform effector functions. B, it will be activated and perform effector functions. And A, it is refractory to antigen stimulation. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Boris. This is our last question of the evening. We'll give all of you a few moments to respond, and then, of course, we will move on to our raffle and special offer. I right, see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. Next week's topic, once again, is going to be pharmacology. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. And it was close. 28% of you selected it is refractory to antigen stimulation. 26% of you selected C and 25% of you selected D. So it was very, very close here. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed A, it is refractory to antigen stimulation. And 28% of you got it right. So another challenging question. But remember, you're going to have these questions on test day. And if you can answer these questions, you can certainly answer the easier ones. So pay attention to Boris now and you'll nail it on test day. Boris. Thank you, Sean. Definitely a tough question. Um, so let's take a look at what's going on. So with T cell activation, there are two signals required, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide. Sean has gone ahead and pulled up uh, that nice image from first day talking about uh, T cell activation, okay? So two signals are required for T cell activation by antigen stimulation, okay? You can see there in, in step number two, signal number one is uh, in this situation, exogenous antigen being presented on MHC2, okay? That's the example in this question was um, MHC class two, so that's kind of what we'll talk about from this table, okay? Now, signal two is known as the co-stimulatory signal, and that's in step number three that's listed there. So co-stimulatory signal, um, this occurs via the interaction of B7 protein on the antigen presenting cell and CD28 on the T cell, okay? So the peripheral T cells undergo peripheral tolerance, 
in this question. So when a T cell engages an antigen presenting cell and receives the first signal, but not the second signal or that co-stimulatory signal, that T cell is made refractory to any future stimulation, okay? And if you take a look at the bottom, there's another uh, section in first aid that talks about this. That's called energy, okay? When a cell cannot become activated, okay? So it's when T cells are exposed to the antigen without signal two, without that co-stimulatory signal, okay? So if we go back and take a look at the answer choices, hopefully you guys will start to see why answer choice A is the best answer that it is refractory to antigen stimulation. And we'll take a look at the, excuse me, the other answer choices and why those are incorrect as well. So answer choice E, clonal expansion. Um, uh, with that, uh, that is incorrect because that has to do with B lymphocytes, not T lymphocytes. It is B lymphocytes that undergo clonal expansion. Answer choice D, um, antigen presenting cells undergo apoptosis uh, when cytotoxic T cells bind to MHC class one on virus infected cells. And we're talking about MHC class two here. Answer choice C and B. Um, uh, as, as we mentioned, um, you know, T cells require two signals uh, to become activated. So that is also, so both answer choice B and C would be incorrect because they wouldn't be activated without that additional binding or additional second signal. So hopefully you guys are under, are, are able to understand this question. It's definitely an important concept. Um, and a lot of these question, questions that we went over today are important in immunology. Um, great job on the questions today. And I will hand it back to you, Sean.